Before we start, I just want a quick trigger warning. This episode covers some sensitive topics that might be difficult for some people to hear. Hello, and as always, welcome to the Tales to Inspire podcast. I'm your host, Chris Patel, and today we've got another really special and inspiring guest, Lindy Bitkowska. But before we begin, I want to remind you that you can become part of this inspirational community. We have our Patreon, where you can donate as little as £2 a month to this inspirational movement. We also have our social media channels at Tales to Inspire. And if you want a bespoke workshop for the children at your school or for adults in your workplace, then get in touch because we've got something for you. Now, on to today's guest. Lindy Vitkowska is an incredible person. Her story is one with lots of downs, but some incredible ups. And her determination to transform her situation is something quite remarkable. You're going to absolutely love her. She's an incredible person, and I can't wait for you to hear. So I hope you enjoy, and see you soon. Lindy Vitkowska, welcome to the Tales Inspire. <laughs> Cheers. Welcome to the Tales Inspire podcast. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So, Lindy, do you want to just explain who you are, where you're from, and, and we'll we'll introduce yourself and we'll go from there? Yeah. So, I'm Lindy Vitkowska. I'm in Liverpool. Been here all my life. I'm, who I am? Oh, who am I? That's a good question. Who am I? What am I? I'm a lot of different things. I'm a bit of a multiplicity, to be fair. I've got a very a collection of very odd things that I've always done in my life. So, yeah, I'm a current uh, scholar student who are about to graduate as a philosopher theologian i'm also a burlesque performer i'm also director of a cic and i'm a mom and i'm a bodybuilder i love that <laughs> there's, so, there's so much to go into it's so cool but lindy where did it all begin tell me about family life as a kid like, like brothers and sisters and, and how how it began oh my family life's kind of crazy so i grew up in the 80s in liverpool which meant you know a lot of poverty the standard that was everyone's life in in 80s Liverpool but I am the eldest of many children so my my mum and my biological father had me and this is where my story is already interesting because I actually don't know um the stories change depending on who you talk to so I actually don't know my start of my story so my mum and dad separated at some point depending on who you ask that that answer changes and then they both went on to have other families and my mum remarried uh, my stepdad raised me from quite young along with my mum and then they had another five children so my brothers and sisters I just call them brothers and sisters there you know I was raised with them they are my siblings and then my biological dad went on to have another four so I'm the eldest of ten <laughs> um yeah and I actually don't really see any of them I was raised a Jehovah's Witness for quite a long time until I got kicked out um, when I was 30 uh, for being a naughty, naughty gal. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I, I got married at 19, uh, kind of through an arrangement, not an arranged a marriage as such, I say that in a loaded time, I sometimes say that just to shock people. But yeah, we were, me and my, my ex-husband were kind of told we were getting married, we were already dating, so, and that led to some odd things had a few extra traumas in my my upbringing but my parents tried very hard but just yeah through a series of unfortunate events I was exposed to a few people that should definitely have been not near children and then yeah I that trauma kind of went through my 20s trying to deal and process that process the the real dad issue things going on and the lies that were coming out so I, I went through a very odd period in my 20s I had a lot of identity issues because of the religion because of parental I my lineage I, I there was a lot of confusion about who I was where I came from and all of that um a few issues around sort of I, th I think a lot of people who have had like sort of an estranged parent go through similar stuff anyway my dad was my biological father rather which was, was quite um he had a lot of his own traumas going on like from what i understand my grandmother had killed herself and he was very young when that happened so he dealt with a lot lashed out in a lot of ways which as a child is not something you should really see or be exposed to and so there was a lot just there so i acted out an awful lot in my 20s and wasn't really sure but by this point i was having my own children which 
we also have a lot of my own parental issues. So we've gone in, we've gone in deep, and we've gone in hard, haven't we? Um, <laughs> we really have. We, re but Lindy, like you said, start from the start. The start is the worst bit for me. <laughs> it gets nicer though. But that's where it's really important, isn't it? Like, yeah. And I think that's where, obviously, your your parents separating and stuff, and like, what dream did you have? Dreams as a kid, like with that kind of an upbringing, like, did you know what you wanted to do or wanted no. to be? I grew up with I have no talent. I have I I grew up believing I was a really unattractive, unintelligent, uninteresting, boring no special abilities whatsoever i was going to hit the middle of the road find a mediocre job that will sustain me probably in tesco you know that kind of thing something that was just going to be i didn't have a dream you know ask me what i wanted to be when i grow up alive was kind of my goal and i i always i don't really go into that because it implies that like maybe i had a horrific ch childhood and i really didn't like horrific things happened but me and my brothers and sisters all got along great. My my mum, you know, despite the, obviously she gone through extreme trauma with my biological dad, you know, they they tried hard. They they worked well. They they didn't <laughs> they didn't mean for this shit to happen. Oh, can you swear on this? Oh, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I'm not very professional. Um, yeah, so I didn't have a bad childhood. Just bad things happened in it. But so I but I just didn't. I was very uninspired by pretty much anything i was just kind of going through survival mode really i suppose that that was it i was in survival mode there was there wasn't much room for anything else there was no yeah no inspiration at all really so in terms of like the the jehovah's witness kind of religion and things like that i don't know anything about it and mm. i don't often talk about religion on, on the podcast but um can you just tell me a little bit about little bit more about what that is and how it is as a child and, and what the kind of circumstances are around that yeah so my mom and my mom and my dad they became Jehovah's Witnesses at some point in my life I think I was about maybe eight or nine when my mom started and my dad was maybe when I was my early teens it's Christian so it's it's very similar to sort of evangelical Christians most people know it for not celebrating Christmas and birthdays and not having blood transfusions other than that, it's a very sort of Christian, sort of conservative religion. And I'm, I, I can't say that I have a mass load of awful experiences from it. I certainly not want to criticise it as a as a, a whole. It just didn't fit me. Because it didn't fit me, I was kind of being encouraged to be a certain person that didn't fit me. And then there was a few fundamental things I didn't agree and they, their stance is... Um, they wouldn't say anti-LGBT, <laughs> but you certainly can't be openly LGBT within it. And I, I kind of, as a core, even though I was brought up with that belief, it really didn't sit well. So I really didn't fundamentally believe it. And then that caused issues with the congregation and the elders, they're kind of like the overseers, because they were coming to my husband saying, well, she's kind of, you need to get her in line, which as you you know, you've met me. I'm not really a very good person to be told to get in line. <laughs> so I started to act out and he started to act out and that, so that jarred a really, that relationship. So yeah, I, it's a tough one because I get what you mean about not talking about religion because it's difficult to talk about my experiences without seeming like I'm bashing it because I'm not. It's just, it just didn't sit with me as a person, I suppose. And I get that. I get that completely. And it's, it's it's weird isn't it because the last thing i'm here to do is to judge it's your story yeah. and but the the thing is it's your experience of what you've been through and the only mm -hmm. person who knows that is you yeah right so part of me is like just however you want to say it go for it like kind of thing but it's uh it's really it's really interesting isn't it and how does your journey go so teenage years obviously you said you met your first husband first but, husband first husband yeah. but how did you guys meet how, where did that go we actually met at one of the jehovah's witness um in fact we met as very young children so this is the thing with jehovah's Witness: it's very interconnected families hang out with families and it's very it's very insular so you're not encouraged to basically associate outside of your jehovah's witness bubble so you can go to work and you go to school because you you know you have to do that you have to be part of the the outside world they would literally call it the world you have to be part of the world 
um, as opposed from the people in the truth, and that they're literally the terminology they would use. Um, so you you're to be no part of the world unless you have to be. So if you wanted to socialize, you only socialized with Jehovah's Witnesses. So as um, I remember my gran taking me to Rob's house as a child, and oh no, it was a, it was another family member, but our families were very interconnected, and then. Yeah, we were in our teens and we met at one of our big conventions. So there was, oh, it's not even mine, all oh, big conventions. Um, they have several conventions a year and he was in attendance helping out, as was I. And we just we just got chatting and then we, he overheard that we had the same birthday. And he was like, hey, that's a segue in. <laughs> um, that's literally how that happened. Yeah. And then that lasted for 10 years and I was divorced before I was 30. <laughs> So you together for, the, for a whole 10 years? Yeah. And what was what was that like? Did you have kids during that time? And we then... have three, well, we actually have, we actually have four children. So our first was actually stillborn. Um, I was 20 at the time and he was 21. So we would, we'd only been married 18 months and we had a stillbirth. So yeah, told you, start my jaw story, it gets really traumatic. Um, so yeah, that obviously shaped an awful lot about how I saw the world. And again, in my twenties, then it was another layer of things to kind of process because we were we were grieving and struggling. My <laughs> gets a little bit worse again. My um, my mother and his mother paid for us to go on a little holiday because at the time we were living with his his mom and his sister and his brother, so we didn't really have any space to kind of grieve or have any time to think. So. They paid for us to go away for a week and um, whilst I was away I was attacked <laughs> quite um, aggressively so I was left in the middle of the street naked with glass on my feet, scratches all over my body um, and it actually there was a group of children that were on a resort that actually raised the alarm and I got basically rescued by some of the mums and then yeah we came home and they, our parents were like you don't seem very well rested. I was like, mm, yeah, I'm tired. <laughs> and we didn't tell anyone. Um, and then he was left with guilt because um, he he was thinking I was taking a bit long because I was only pop, only pop the shop. I was like literally pop the shop for our lunch. It was like middle of the day. And he was feeling bad that he didn't get up and look for me, which, yeah, I felt for him because it wasn't his fault. <laughs> yeah. And then when, when you say attacks, you was on holiday and someone physically attacked you, like yeah, like um, sexually attacked you, or what? Yeah, well, he tried. He didn't get that far. I'm stubborn, and I just bought tins of soup. So they were like the dentist tins of soup you've ever seen in your life. I was just swinging the carrier bag round and round. Uh, <laughs> so he he tried, but he didn't get that far. He he managed to literally rip my clothes off. Um, I, had, I had like a bikini and like a wrap on, so he'd rip that off. Um, which was why I had the scratches. Um, my shoes came off from running, um, but he didn't actually manage to get that far to actually do anything more than that. So yeah, that was that was that thing that happened. And then, yeah, we came home not long later. In fact, we found out not long later that I was um, pregnant and it worked out I would have got pregnant on the holiday. So then there was this whole thing of how he succeeded there, there would have just been this whole you know my son quite possibly might not have been my ex-husband's you know his his father might have been different so not that that actually was a thing but you just you, you worry about things that aren't even things that you're like it didn't that didn't happen so I didn't have anything to worry about but it was a a thing that went through my head and then we had another two children after that so we have three so we have Carl, Aisha and Emily um, Aisha has quite a few health issues, which was a, a thing to deal with for a while, but she's all good for the most part. And then we did eventually crumble under what was quite a lot to deal with through our relationship, as well as all the religious and family pressure. And we, we did, we, we, we split in my, my late twenties. Was that, um, was that an amicable split or? No. <laughs> it was because things had got quite toxic because of everything going on with the religion and everything we the ultimately we still loved each other but we a lot of things had happened and 
we'd hurt each other a lot both as things have gone on it starts off with little things that started to snowball um and it got quite aggressive and so for for the children i was like this needs to stop and i i need i need to be away from this trauma and he was just for me he just epitomized my trauma like he didn't do anything to hurt me physically or anything but he just epitomized that trauma and i just needed to be away and needs to be over and then he had only that at that point realized that his behavior had pushed me to do certain things and how this had all spiraled and but because that love was ultimately still there it became a bit of a fight and then i got disfellowshipped from i so we'd split and we we got into separate bedrooms um and i started dating again at some point i think it was a few months later went on a date with someone slept with them and then he found out my ex-husband found out and um basically got me to go to the elders and tell them i committed adultery and got kicked out of the church or kicked out of the congregation on the grounds of fornication and adultery whilst rob um basically got he got a slap on the wrist from and told well she's a handful isn't she so you know we know that you've behaved silliness because she's hard work <laughs> okay so that's what happens with the children what happens next what well, where do mm. things start to go things went a bit weird then so my family still being jehovah's witnesses and his family which are very devout jehovah's witnesses basically then set um, and they tried to actually send me, take me to court on multiple occasions. And this was my family as well. They teamed up with his family together <clears throat> to basically gain custody so that I would lose the children on the grounds that I was a bad influence um, because I'd slept with someone after a date. <laughs> on the grounds that I was a loose, immoral woman. And I was going to be a bad influence on them and I couldn't possibly care for them. Um, they lost, obviously, because literally it didn't even go to, well, the first one didn't go to court. Literally the solicitor just wrote back going, what do you want? Like, this is ridiculous, you've got no case. Um, they tried again, and they tried a, diff a slightly different route that the second time. And again, the judge just went, what is your problem? Like, you have unlimited access. She doesn't stop you from, like, um, go into the congregation and letting the children learn about being a witness still you have unlimited access you gives you all the information you want like what is your problem and we worked really hard on that and we actually have a really really good relationship as parents now and we are a very big disjointed family but um he has another partner and as do i and the children another child and we do have a really really good relationship now but it took a long time of me digging my heels in going it's not about me or you, it's about the kids. And trying to just ride the wave and people are like, why are you still being nice? It's like, because it's not about me. <laughs> and I was still going through this phase of, I didn't have dreams or aspirations or anything. So I didn't care if I suffered because that's I'd kind of, that's all I'd ever known. I didn't need to do anything for myself because it wasn't about me, it was just about the kids what that actually then led to was the person who i'd gone on a date with ended up moving in at some point um obviously robert moved out and everything by this point and he turned out to be a really really nasty piece of work and i kind of i i kind of did know it but i kind of ignored it on the basis of because of all of the witness stuff i kind of believed i deserved to be punished um, I was a bad woman. I was immoral. I was, you know, not really of much standard. I was always kind of disregarded as the, the wild card, you know, problem. You know, my father had left. My husband had now left. My religion had kicked me out. My parents had sided with my ex-husband. Because of that social network of you, you only associate within that, I lost all my friends as well. Because when you get kicked out the Jehovah's Witness, you're not allowed any contact with anyone because you're now part of the world so they you are barricaded out and so i lost i lost my everything i lost my family my husband my social network everything and so i became quite vulnerable 
after <laughs> husband number two, because we got married very quick. I, I, people were saying to me, the people who were still in my life were saying like, he's not good. You need to be careful. And I was just like, no, no, it's fine. And I was like, no, I know. Um, but it's, you know, it's just me that's going to suffer. You know, I kind of, I felt like I deserved it. He was my, my penance in some respect. And yet, I don't regret the relationship because what it did teach me was it kind of, it gave me a little bit of fire in my belly because he kind of forced me into a scenario, not a scenario, but he kind of, because he kept pushing. I think he must have, he must have hit something at some point where I kind of went, no, hang on a minute. <laughs> and the wake up call was, there was a situation with my dogs. Um, I had um, two Malamutes, so they were really, really tall dogs. And um, one of them walked in front of the TV and he was playing a computer game and he kicked it in the face. And I was just like, you're a time bomb. You just, you're a time bomb. And I could see it. Um, and there was a little things he kept saying, things like, oh, do you not think, um, do you not think that you maybe need to lose a bit more weight? And at this time I was about eight stone. So I was already underweight and I was just, because I'm not actually stupid, even though I believed I was, I was like, mm, I'm not though. I'm, I know that that's not a good thing. And so people started to keep pulling me to the side going, you've lost a lot of weight. Is everything okay? I was like, yeah, it's fine. Like I'm not dying. I'm not trying to lose weight. So what I did was I set up a separate bank account and started to save money. I upped the house insurance. I changed my passwords on everything, which he spotted within about two minutes because he messaged me straight away and said, why is your Facebook password changed? <laughs> I was like, hmm, that's very interesting. And I booked myself a cottage with the kids, put the dogs in kennels for a weekend and I just went away and I texted him and I just said, I'll be back on Monday and you're not going to be there. And he didn't argue when I come back and I expected the house to be absolutely destroyed because he had an anger issue. And I expected him to have trashed the house. And the reason I put the dogs in kennels is I expected him to hurt the dogs um, or hurt us if I did this in person. So I just texted him and said, you won't be there. And he just went, okay. And when I told the children, as I picked them up from school, um, we got in the car, I was like, we're going. I expected them to like, and they were like, oh, has he taken the Xbox? I was like, he's going to take the Xbox. They were like, oh, oh, well, can we get a new one? Like, we can get a new Xbox and be like, okay, no problems. They were not on the slightest bit bothered. And it's only now their process and their things. I realized actually it wasn't just me that was suffering. They did too. And the way he behaved has impacted on them, which has left me with a little bit of uh, guilt. <laughs> and then I hit my thirties. I got remarried, uh, had another, had another baby, Luna. And Luna became the little magic gem that kind of opened my eyes. And I kind of had her and I was like, I kind of need to, I need to do something. My mother-in-law had bought me um, a car for the, cause now I had four children. I needed a bigger car. So she bought me a car. I realized I needed to do something very drastic in my life or I was never going to be able to do simple, not simple, but you know, things like buying a car for my children or helping them in any way but as they get older. I was kind of been on this rat race and everything for a while. And so I decided to, I decided to open a shop when my daughter was four weeks old. Don't do that. I don't recommend it at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I opened the dress shop. Um, it's called Lindy's Vintage Boutique and I made and sold vintage replica dresses and I loved my little shop and then I'd had my shop for, for some time when a photographer walked in and handed me a flyer for alternative fashion fest I was like you should uh you should do this I was just like mm, whatever um he was like no no you should you should do this my mate Jane is putting on this show you should be in this show I was like um okay well whatever so I kind of took it on and I messaged Jane I was like get some information about it. And I was a bit hesitant at first. I didn't jump on straight away. And then Jane being Jane, 
messaged me back and she was like you're doing it then I was like mm, I guess I am now because <laughs> you've asked me again um and there I go to Alt Fashion Fest which later became uh Art and Soul as part of the Art and Soul family did the first show I was the first designer out it was great absolutely epic loved it um during all this time as well being a performer I'd started dance I actually danced an awful lot more during my second relationship because I meant I got out of the house an awful lot so I'd been around a lot of performance by this point and a lot of dancing and um so I really enjoyed it because it really tickled that sort of performer aspect that I love and then oh, what happened oh she did just a second show and I loved the first one so I was like okay I'll do the second one as well came along to the rehearsals and I, I kind of noticed that she was running around soft trying to do so much on her own and I um was like mm, I'd, I've spotted a few things can I give you some feedback I think this might help and she was like yes please come help and then afterwards she was like can you can you help with um some organizer for some future shows um, and can you model I was like yeah sure and she was like well can you perform as well I was like uh, yeah sure whatever and then then I just got sucked into the whole craziness that is the world that we now live in of uh, Art and Soul and AFF and it was very short time later I became the director and Jane whisked me around the country doing shows left right and centre and it was at one of these shows that we had a performer booked I'd actually met this performer already and this is where Little Peaches comes into my story so Little Peaches I've met in my shop uh, for auditions for uh, that for Alt Fashion Fest, I'd let my shop be used for this. And um, she was our burlesque performer for a big show in Alexandra Palace in front of 4,000 people. And I was taking the clothes down there. We were doing an AFF show. And last minute, Little Peaches um, felt poorly. Little Peaches has um, Ehlers Dallas syndrome. And I only tell you that because that becomes another part of my story. And so we were like, what are we gonna do? We had no budget, we had no time to we choreograph we just didn't know what to do so i just went fuck it i'll do it filled a place accidentally got an international career on the back of that because it just spiraled into people just kept them wanting me to come to these shows I, I initially did them with aff and then people just kept asking me to come perform and now that's a whole side persona i have on top of everything else and then i closed my shop and i came and worked with jane full time with art and soul and then little peaches actually comes back into my story so whilst on my journey of performing um my health has always been a bit dodgy um i've always had joint issues i've always had various things going on but i'd always kind of been a little bit denial like i'd go for a walk go in the ministry which is where jehovah's witnesses go knocking on doors and the next day i'd be on crutches which didn't really i didn't really realize that was disproportionate because that was my life I was used to it I didn't really take that as a big deal because I just, just you just do don't you you don't have any frame of reference and then I'd, and I'd always suffered with joint issues and I'd had a big injury at one point and we just assumed it was always to do with that and then in 2018 I had quite a big lapse with my health um I kept losing my eyesight I kept losing my voice I kept getting paralysis down my, my left side and Andy my, my husband basically had just had enough one day and he was just like I'm taking to the this is stupid you, you need to go and see someone and they were just like so how long have you been diagnosed for EDS for um which is the same condition as little features like oh I actually got diagnosed when I was 17 like you are aware that that means you are disabled I was like no no, no it's, it's fine I've just got joint issues like no 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 you and they were like, you also have something else going on as well because EDS doesn't cause paralysis or sight loss. So we need to check that. And so then I got diagnosed with functional neurological disorder as well. And then for the rest of 2018, I was pretty much in a wheelchair. And the only time I could walk was when I was actually performing. And I'd stay in a wheelchair the whole time until I was backstage. And then I'd go on stage, perform, get back in my wheelchair and go home literally carried to the side of stage at times use everything that I had just to perform and then spend the next week in bed 
And I still didn't tell anyone. I was still in the closet about this. No one knew a thing about it. Um, only those that were really close to me or people who'd seen me backstage were aware. Jane obviously knew. And then it was, and then it was Little Peaches um, who came and spoke to me. She was like, hey, would you mind doing a photo shoot about us being like disabled performers and just kind of being like out and proud? It's like, I'm not out and proud. <laughs> She's like, you know. And she was like, yeah, well, you're going to be now. Not in so blunted terms, but in blunted terms. And then we got there and we did the shoot. And she was like, oh, by the way, we're also doing a show called Disabilities. So the whole show is going to be cabaret performers with disabled, like with a variety of disabilities. So we're going to do that. Um, and you're going to host it. And you're also going to perform it. I was like, what? And she's like, oh, other surprise, the BBC are also going to film it and they're doing a documentary. So you're in that too. So I went from being completely in the closet to being on the BBC with my boobs out. And so then there's my joint junior as well. So Lindy, can you explain a bit about, so EDS, what does that stand for? Uh, it's Ellis Dallas syndrome. Okay. So it's uh, it's a faulty gene with the collagen. So basically it means the collagen doesn't work properly in your joints or in your muscles. So it means that um, if you're, so your muscles are like elastic bands, you stretch it, it goes back. With EDS, once it's stretched, that's it. That's Once you've passed that point, it doesn't ever go back. So it means that your joints are always constantly fighting to stay in place. They don't always win. So it means they very often come out. It also, you're very prone to like organ ruptures and things like that. Dislocations are a daily thing. It's quite painful. Um, not just the dislocations, but just the, the general fatigue in the muscles, just constantly with that fight. Um, so that's EDS in a nutshell. And what about burlesque dancing? Can you tell me more about burlesque? Um, so burlesque, burlesque has been a funny one for me because when I actually started it, I was actually really, um, this is a, a, a knock-on effect from being a Jehovah's Witness and there's an, always an, an element of modesty. And then my own insecurities, by this point I'd had so much heartbreak and so much like trauma. One of the ways that came out was I was, I'd have a panic attack if I seen anyone slightly semi-nude. And this was men and women. This wasn't just like a, I was comparing my body to a beautiful woman. It was, I, it just would send me into that absolute panic. So I was probably the only straight woman watching Thor just going, beautiful but can you put a top on <laughs> it would like just send me into overdrive so being a burlesque performer i was suddenly confronted with all these incredible humans in various states of undress at all times um it was like it's like a baptism of fire which has been one of the best things for my mental health because that's one thing that's really improved has been able to do that and burlesque in itself is so burlesque started in ancient greece do you want me to teach you in ancient Greece at the Festival Dionysus and it was when women weren't allowed to speak publicly especially about political matters they were allowed to show their bodies so the word burlesque actually means satire and mockery so it's think of it as the spitting image of dance right. so we think of burlesque as being the sparkles the glamour and the boobies but actually it's usually a form of storytelling we usually wear the uh, cheeky side wing to stage kind of thing so there's a lots and lots of different avenues of burlesque some of it's very classical and soft and gentle and other of it some of it is quite aggressive some of it most of it is very political um it's always about the performer expressing a story of some description um whether that story is a sensual one or damn right angry one just depends on what she feels like on the day oh she he they can be anyone <laughs> right okay so i'm learning so much <laughs> no, I, I know i talk like a million miles a minute as well <laughs> and it's, so you get into this new world being mm -hmm. a burlesque dancer that you never thought you would be and never planned on being it i don't know if you know anything about it you didn't never know seen it. i was performing all over the world and i still hadn't seen a show and you was known as being disabled but mm -hmm. you didn't kind of accept that because you never thought of it as being disabled so you've got this new concept there that you've got to kind of live with. How did you cope with being told you have a disability? 
um, I got into bodybuilding um, because obviously that's what you do when you're told that you've got issues with your joints you decide to go into a sport that uh, <laughs> seemingly would put pressure on that um, and again it came from that sort of a response to trauma I, I started bodybuilding in 2014 I'd always been into sports and stuff anyway um, one of my injuries was caused doing sports and stuff so this wasn't like a a wild sort of segue in my life even though it looks like way, that way on paper and so I messaged my old coach I was like I'm currently I'm um, having a baby with Luna I was like um can I can I stop training with you and she's like yeah let me know when you've had the baby so 10 hours later I messaged her I was like okay she's here so like, what you're in labor I was like, yeah I was bored I needed something to do and <laughs> distract myself from the labor um and so I started to coach with her once it was all safe after Luna was born um so at the time I opened my shop I also started bodybuilding and training and getting ready for comps because you know why why do things slowly and subtly when you can just hit it with a sledgehammer um it's pretty much how I live my life and um yeah I started to I started to train I was off and on for trying to compete for a couple of years and then I eventually did compete in 2017 I came top six in the UK BFF for one of their competitions and then I did another show later that year and this was just before my health started to go a bit funny and so did a show later that year so the back end of 2017 and um I dislocated both of my ankles just before I went on stage and I already had my heels on and the way the shoes are really t quite tight so I knew if I took my shoes off my feet were going to swell and I'd never get those shoes back on so I decided to reset my ankles while still in the heels and the heels are like yay big they're huge wow. but they're, they're not like they're not like nice little delicate heels that the the platform heels um so I reset my ankles and pretty much just got pushed on stage they were just like you're either getting on stage now or you're not doing it at all and and you know you're an athlete you know what it's like you you get given that line at that point you, you you're doing it come what may you, you push through it when you should or you shouldn't so I I went out it was horrific came last I had a horrific experience and drove home in pain and just cried the whole way and then I had about five cheeseburgers at the services um it was, they were good cheeseburgers though really enjoyed them <laughs> one good thing from the day oh yeah great cheese burgers you appreciate food on another level after a comp and um <laughs> you'll you'll appreciate the small things in life um and I still was like oh, it's okay you know what I'll just I'll reconfigure you know you win some you lose some attitude don't worry about it um everything's a learning experience kind of thing I'll come back next year but obviously by this point my health had started to decline and then in 2018 it was when I started to have the really really bad issues so it just never quite happened and my old coach Nikki god love her she would get me at the gym she'd like, come meet me for coffee I was like Nick I'm I can't she's like let's go train I was like I'm in a chair I've got two crutches she's like just come anyway I'm like, for goodness sake so I'd turn up and she'd be like there and she'd be like right just get just jump on this machine we'll just we'll just see what you know we'll just build some strength back it's like nick i can't even get onto the machine she was like it's fine someone will lift you on and then she's calling over these giant bodybuilders to lift me on and off machines um and she's like it's okay babe we can do this together you're just a bit fluffy <laughs> it's fine it's not a problem um and slowly but surely she actually helped me build up a bit of strength in my legs so i could stand and walk again um she wasn't really one for just let me sit down she's like no, no no we can get this done and then she actually in start 2019 was diagnosed with cancer and then secondary cancer later that year and we actually lost her april last year so by this point she wasn't just my coach she was like my best mate um she was that person that you could tell everything to and um i was really scared after that happened with my own health and everything else that had gone on and the fact i think when i met you chris i started crying because this was also fresh i was like i need to i need to do another comp because if i don't i'm i'm gonna just fall 
down to the bottom of every wine bottle there is. I'm going. I, I needed some sense of control, so I decided to get back into bodybuilding just just to get my body moving, just to do something, just to feel in control of my disability, in control of my grief. Just do something. Just I was so scared of being left alone with my grief, and then I accidentally came across a federation that had a disability class. So I had a fuck it, let's do it moment and signed up. Still didn't have a coach, still wasn't sure what I was going to do. I just decided to put my money where my mouth was and just signed up for it. I eventually found um, another coach. I was already like eight weeks into competition prep before I found a coach. Um, found this fantastic woman who is just awesome. She's all about putting your health first not pushing through come what may, you know, you know, she she'd would rather you be healthy and happy than with a nice shiny trophy. But I got a nice shiny trophy anyway. I came first um in my show, in my in my class. Um I got an invitation to the British finals and I came third in over 35s. And then and that was an able class as well. So I placed over um able athletes, which was huge. That that was just nothing I expected I literally was only doing that one for for like experience practice kind of thing um I did not expect to walk away with anything from that one and then two weeks later I took the British championships for disability um so within two weeks I walked away with three trophies but that first show was on Nikki's birthday and yeah so yeah it, it was a mixture of trauma and grief and all of them things all mixed in together just makes this weird little cocktail lindy how does bodybuilding i tell me more about bodybuilding i don't know enough about it but how does it help you with your grief i find after a really good bodybuilding session it's really cathartic um it's like it's all them good hormones. Um, I know I've I've done a good job when I want to have a good cry. It's just a release. So for me, I suppose it'll be similar to a boxer and you know going and having like punching the bag or something. It's that for me, it's a release um, and it's a way of channeling something. So I'll stick. I'll have I've got a couple of playlists. I've got playlists for when I'm like on beast mode. As cheesy as that sounds, I have a playlist for when I'm struggling and I, but I need to get through the the workout for a, a comp or whatever. And then I have. It's my Nikki workout playlist. And because Nikki was so connected to me with bodybuilding, for me, like, it's it's a way of... For me, it's like going to church and lighting a candle. So me doing a shoulder press. I remember the first time I was taught how to do a shoulder press and Nikki's behind me and whispering in my ear and just being that little angel on my shoulder. Now, a little bit too literally. <laughs> and just... I don't know, it's something to do with that release of all them endorphins and everything coming into it. Um, and then going and feeling a little bit stronger and doing a little bit better the next time and just getting the, the satisfaction out of it, for me, it just becomes a way of channeling it, like any exercise, I suppose, like having a dance or going for a run. I love it. And that's because I think bodybuilding gets a bad rep where people obviously talk about drugs and talk about enhancing themselves in unnatural ways and things. But the way that you just talked about it is it's very much a therapeutic reason and intention behind it. Um, so, you yeah, know, I, I absolutely love it. And where do you find yourself from there? Where does your journey go? I assume it's probably more towards where you are now, really. Yeah. Well, accidentally, I started to get a little bit of, um, you know, you, you take a championship. Some people suddenly take notice of who you are. Um, so I've actually been invited this year to two separate, um, um, fitness expos. So they're kind of all arenas. It's not just bodybuilding, it's for any fitness. Um, so I'm invited to the body power, which is one of the biggest, I think it's the biggest sort of fitness expo in the UK. It's been running for years and years. So it's about 40,000 people. So they've invited me to come along and talk on the education stage about bodybuilding and disability and how I navigate that along with my friend Matt um, who has cerebral palsy um, so he's going to be with me there and then I've been invited to the Fit Expo which is actually right here in Liverpool uh, again on their education stage to talk about again fitness and bodybuilding and disability and um, showing that 
bodies aren't just this one thing like bodies come in all shapes and sizes and disability doesn't look like one thing and this is what we did with the disabilities documentary as well it was kind of showing that disability doesn't mean you're not able to do something it doesn't mean you are disabled it just means that we do things in a different way not that we're differently abled it's just the world is built for able people not that disabled people inherently are like unable and so that's what we decided to do um and obviously i'm going to compete again i've got a uh, a line of shows lined up one of which so the biggest show at the moment is called uh the arnold's in the uk and that's where people can go and qualify for their pro status so you can become a professional athlete um uh, which comes you know lots of you know other potential avenues and work streams and money sources and stuff like that um some people do it just for the, the status of it um, and then go back to the banking job um, with a little bit of a little bit of pressure and a few creative words by emails and a few friends of us, a few other disabled athletes have got together and wrote a few words. Um, we've actually convinced them to put on a class so that disabled people for the first time ever in the UK can actually qualify for a pro card in the UK, um, meaning that for the first time disabled athletes can actually get you know professional status wow that is that's huge because you're you're making the systematic change through your own story wow i just love that absolutely incredible because you're changing things you're making a difference you you're a system changer you're a shaker up or you're a, an awareness raiser boom a sledgehammer that yeah. definitely goes with you lindy definitely lindy. <laughs> so you've got so you've got mother of th four mm -hmm. wife Mm -hmm. you're a bodybuilder yeah. a burlast dancer around the world you're doing your well you've not talked about your degree i haven't even mentioned my degree no yeah no, so how did you get into doing your degree um it was on the it was it was a bit of a spare of the moment thing everything in case you haven't noticed everything in my life was a spare of the moment decision or i've gone i'm gonna do this um and then some of it leads into a thing and some of it does not um i just filled in um a UCAS form one night and just hoped for the best and I joined a marketing and business degree with a foundation year because because I didn't have any dreams or aspirations I didn't really do anything from school because I was in that system of you get married you have children your husband will be the provider and you will maybe work part-time but you you know look after the children so and university is not something that's really encouraged as a um when you're a witness and it was always something I wanted to do, but never really something I believed I could do. I thought I'd maybe start, but I might get kicked out. I probably won't even get in. I got in on a foundation year. I'd sat there for two weeks and I hated it. I realized I hated everything about marketing and business, though it just didn't sit with me. I just, I couldn't do it. I kept crying. I couldn't figure it out. I, it wasn't sitting well with me. So I convinced them to just swap a couple of my modules around and change it to a, a foundation law degree, which I loved actually. Law was something I, really really enjoyed doing but on this journey this one module was called critical thinking um and it was very philosophy and just because of the lecturer who happened to be a drag queen nun who happens to be a friend um it's another story <laughs> um there was a heavy dose of theology in there as well but and obviously my whole roots have been a jehovah's witness and so it was really challenging the way i'd saw the world going from being a Christian to being a, a I call it a post-Christian and then suddenly unsure where I, my spiritual beliefs sat and everything um but with this heavy dose of cynicalism I can't even say words I'm clever I promise um with philosophy was all into connecting and I was like oh I really enjoy that I want to do that I love law but I really want to do that so I did I switched again for when I started first year to philosophy ethics and theology which I've just loved really and I'm about to qualify I've just got accepted onto my master's um in religious studies and so yeah that'll be the new thing so now that now there is a dream and uh, now on hopefully next year I'll um start my PhD if I pass my master's yeah and I want to now the dream is to write and be opinionated <laughs> I love it I love it. And using those opinions to make change and to really make an impact as well. And just 
So cool. Lindy, you're really cool. Um, <laughs> so going from this, so you got, you're at where you are. Uh, we didn't talk about the fact that I think you did mention that you're a director. You're a director. Yeah, director of Art of yeah. Yeah. So sort of a community interest company. And what does Art and Soul Tribe do? What's your Ooh. vision and your values? And how does your role play in that? So, Jane wonderful Bellis started Art and Soul Tribe. So it's an alternative way of educating people uh, through well-being. So we use the five, um, the five ways to well-being pathway, and you know it's all about making people feel good inside and out, um, and educating people in alternative methods. I suppose um, Jane's much better at the, the elevator pitch than I am. Um, my role is it. I'm basically the extra person. <laughs> I, I try to be the extra Jane um, because Jane is just a, a one woman army. Um, she really is a force of nature. So I, I try to be there to make sure that I can be a little bit of a firewall for her at times, um, protect her from herself and protect her from other people and just help her a little bit along the way. So I tend to help with a little bit of the, some of the facilitating of the, some of the classes and I teach some of them. And yeah, I just, and do what I can. I love it. Lindy, you're doing so much in your journey to go from where you've been, the struggles, the hardships, the marriages, the abuse, mm. the kids, losing the, your first child and doing what you do, going from no aspirations to huge ones, going to impact people, putting yourself out there on stage and showing the world what you can be, right? Yeah. You really are inspiring. I still don't have a dream, but I, do you know what? I, I feel like I'm kind of just embracing it. I like, I love, like, people see all the things and I'm sometimes a little bit apprehensive to share much of it because people people make judgments and they, they either make judgments about my parents or they make judgments about the religion or they make judgments about who I am. And I'm just a bit like, I'm all right. Like, I'm okay. Sometimes, though, this is a bit of an evil thing that I do. If I don't like, so, not so much if I don't like someone, because I, I tend to like most people. Um, but if someone irritates me, I might just drop a little truth bomb of something that's happened in my life just to watch them just panic. Um, it's probably a bit of a cruel thing to do. But it's funny. My favourite one. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do it to you now, but I've forewarned you so you know it's coming. Um, eventually, I my biological father was actually murdered. Um and this is how I actually met with my other siblings. Um, but every now and again, just like, oh, how was your weekend? All right, just been thinking about when my dad was murdered. And yeah, that was a whole thing. Um, and just watching the, the, the life drain from the face of their going, I don't know how to answer this. And then it's just like, no, it's okay. It's fine. But yeah, I'm sorry. I've just revealed a little bit too much about my own uh, but in, humor. But in, all, but in all seriousness, with, with that kind of thing, and obviously your dad being murdered, you didn't have a relationship with him, mm. did you? No, um, not at all. So, but does that still bring things up in your life? Um, A little bit. There was a, it, it, I graved the, the sort of the, the lack um, and the, the what could have been or what should have been, rather. Not so much that, you know, I didn't really grieve for him as a person because, like you said, there was nothing to grieve. Um, honestly, I don't really, be, as sad as it sounds, I don't really believe that the world lost much. Um, yeah, and so it was an odd one to process because I think people genuinely, they were like, they, and this is a, a big thing of what I do now is people talk about, don't know how to talk about grief. Um, they don't know how to process that. Grief is so, because we've become such a secular world, you know, we've we've lost a lot of that ritual process around grief, like the way tribes would have been all there for people, and there was there was a systematic sort of way. And this is a lot what we do with art and soul as well, is we try to give people that that ritual practice back, not in a religious sense, but in that the the tools to cope with things going forward. Um, and I think it's really really important. And so I think people, I, I I do love talking about death with people, not in a morbid way, but in a way of letting people know that it's okay to talk about death that's not it happens to everyone eventually and it's a really natural normal part of what it is to be human um it shouldn't be something that we're terrified to talk about and it's one of the one of the things i love about art and soul is i get to talk about death quite a lot with some of the groups that i um help facilitate but yeah it was a little insight into my 
Cookie Brain. You're you're very unique. I have to admit, <laughs> Andy, you're very very unique. And honestly, death is something that, like you said, it's the one thing that happens to all of us. Mm-hmm. It's the one thing that none of us want to talk about. It's the one thing that gets put under the carpet, and then when it happens, you're like, "What did what just happened?" Like, not yeah. to me. It happens for everyone else, but not me. I'm yeah. the exception, you know. So it's um, yeah, it's powerful the, what what you're doing, and. I want to get into a quick fire round. Is that all right? Go on. God knows what's so, going to come up my face. Basically, what's going to happen is I'm going to start a sentence and you're going to finish it. Okay. Okay. Bodybuilding. Yay. <laughs> Love that. Fair enough. Is that a sentence? <laughs> yeah. Got- Sorry. That was a genuine response. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. Okay. Helping people can make you feel better Love it. family is important and not always blood that's good life is about chocolate oh <laughs> even though i'm sure when you're when you're when you're training to 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 uh bodybuild you're not having any chocolate um that is that's not necessarily true Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I, I was having donuts two weeks before. <laughs> when, when life's about chocolate, it's, it's got to be incorporated. Definitely. Community. Ooh, everything. Community is everything. And the final question I have here is a little bit different, is if there was one law and it was, it was your law, a government rule that had to be put in place and everyone had to follow it, what would your rule be and why? That empathy was a part of every education system because if empathy was instilled at such a young age, that would unpick so much of what was already at the wrong with the world. If people could truly relate to others and understand that, then that would fix so many of the other knock-on effects. Empathy is everything. Um, 100% with you 100 percent that the fact that we can't connect to people or understand what people have been through is because we have we don't teach it we don't Mm. show it it's we have this we live in this shallow level of life Mm. and we don't get more we're scared to get deeper into it yeah and it's empathy is vital absolutely vital leaders that we have in our society now none of them like they don't show empathy they don't care who they're leading they've never Mm. lived what people have gone through so I love that answer. Love it. <laughs> Great. Let's implement that one. Yeah. Let's get that one implemented. Um, that was Jane. Final... That, that was Jane speaking through me. I can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the final two questions I ask every tale to, tales to inspire guests. So, Lindy Bitkovska, I think I've nailed it that time as well. Get in there. What is your definition of the word inspire? Mm, it's to motivate change, I reckon. Um, you know, that fire and the passion that you see something that motivates you to change, either something in yourself or in the outside world. I love that. Once again, like that, getting that engine going mm. towards where it needs to, to go. Otherwise, mm. it's not going to go anywhere if you don't motivate it. Yeah. Love that. My final question that we ask every Tales to Inspire guest is, if you've lived the best life, imagine you've lived till you're, let's go, 107 years old, okay. right? And you're looking back, you've absolutely smashed it. You're really happy with the life that you've had. What's the biggest impact you want to have had during this lifetime? Oh. I think it's just that I made the people around me happy. Like I do a lot of crazy stuff and I do a lot of big stuff. I do a lot of that stuff accidentally. Um... But I'd, I'd like that the impact would be that I, I, I left people with fond memories and a smile. Fond memories and a smile. Yeah. All these things that we talk about, all the things that you're doing, and I love how it comes down to the simplicity mm. of fond memories and a smile. Mm. That's so powerful. So people can connect to that, right? I think yeah. people can connect to your story, Lindy, like, so many ups and downs Still for everyone in there isn't there? <laughs> there really is like there really is oh wow but honestly lindy thank you so much for being on the tales of Spire podcast thank you for having me of course how amazing is lindy lindy just transforms 
the way that we should think. There's no impossible. And Lindy really exudes that fact that actually the only person holding us back is the person in the mirror. We can get through this. We can break through. She talks about her ups and downs, her struggles where she felt that she didn't really know where life was going. The dreams that she had, did she have any dreams? The family upbringing that she had, the way she had an arranged marriage and the way that went, losing a loved one and just such a tough time. But I really, really hope you enjoyed this amazing person sharing her fantastic tale. Remember that we all have a tale to inspire. Sometimes we just have to dig a little for it to come to the surface.